Hello, my name is Ben Payne. Uh, I'll talk about the physics derivation graph in the context of some foundational concepts as well as design decisions that I made associated with the project. Before uh, going through this presentation, I recommend watching the why video, like why does the project exist? And then I'll just uh, explain sort of like the use cases and, and that sort of thing. My focus here will be more on the sort of technical background on how the project is designed. So to get started as a sort of reminder of why are we interested in this at all, uh, we'll start with expressions. So these are what most people think of when they think of mathematical physics. There's uh, the range of complexity is pretty significant because it covers a lot of different disciplines and therefore a lot of different mathematical expressions are present with lots of different symbols and operators. So I'll focus uh, throughout this talk on sort of a simple expression like V equals D over T. And we typically associate those symbols with uh, uh, some explanation like velocity being related to the distance and time. So that's sort of what we think of as a very straightforward case. So I'm not going to get into the sort of technical details of all the different physics equations that are possible. But just keep in mind that when we're talking about relatively simple equations, they sort of have a, a huge range of complexity. So the first thing that one might think about doing is just writing down all the different equations that are known in physics. It turns out to be a very difficult task. Uh, there's a lot of variation, as I mentioned before, um, and a lot of different disciplines involved. But that's a very doable task, and it, in fact, has been done. Um, so there's currently, on the, on the internet, there's a website called Search on Math, and there I have a tutorial describing that work. Uh, think of it as just they pick all the uh, many different sources of LaTeX based mathematical expressions and wrote a search engine for them. So that's like a potentially relevant thing to do. Um, but the next, my question is, what else could you do with all those different expressions? Is there is there more that could be done? So I think the answer is yes. So there's a quick example of that. I'll go back to my expression here relating velocity, distance, and time. And it's not just a logic expression. It's actually, uh, there's some other meanings associated with it. Like, we know that the different variables here, velocity, distance, and time, each have a dimension. And if you know that, um, then you can actually check the consistency of the expression. So you can say that on the left-hand side, we have length over time. And on the right-hand side, we also have length over time. So that gives us a sense that this expression uh, has some evidence about why it is at least self-consistent. Again, that's not completely going to tell you that it's absolutely correct, but it'll just give you some evidence in that direction. I'll, I'll note here that even this relatively straightforward concept of associating dimensionality with variables in logic expressions is a huge amount of work. Again, going back to sort of the, the breadth and scope of the expressions in mathematical physics, even just this little piece here would be a big investment. So this is relatively straightforward to understand. There's a lot of work, but what else could we do if we had all those expressions? My main focus for the physics derivation graph is the following. The, the idea that a derivation is a sequence of steps. I'll use those uh, phrases repeatedly here uh, in the project, but I'll, I'll just straight up straight, uh, explain that the derivation always has a beginning, it has an end, it's comprised of steps. I think that's relatively straightforward if you've done a derivation in physics before. Um, the thing that um, might be a little bit different to think about is the fact that you can break down these derivations into steps and there's a relation among the expressions. So well, now we'll sort of get into the nitty-gritty of like <laughs> what does it mean to actually have a step in a derivation? And the, there are a couple of things that you might be familiar with and, and maybe one or two new things. So an expression basically always has a left-hand side and a right-hand side at a minimum. There are other features that you might want to include, but that's sort of the bare minimum. Then a step in their derivation sort of gets you from one expression to another expression. And there's some stuff between those two that we'll introduce specific to this project. The concept of an inference rule. This is like describing the how do I get from one expression to another. And sometimes the inference rules themselves take uh, some, some inputs, and so we'll call those feeds. So there's 
Again, this is a relatively straightforward example, but there's a bit of complexity here. We can make it a little bit more intuitive to say, well, there's actually a graph, right? There's different node types, and we can describe those uh, maybe visually, and there's a relation between them, and there's sort of ordering. You can't, you have to get from an expression to another expression via an inference rule. So that's sort of like a visual representation of the concept of a step. Now, previously we had discussed the, the self-consistency of an expression, and next I'm going to talk about the self-consistency of a step. And again, I've just had these four sort of things floating around and I'm drawing directed edges between them, but I want to be a little bit more rigorous about that. So one thing that I can do, I can recognize the inference rule is reversible. So uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, I'm sort of showing an example where I had added something to the left-hand side and that should get me back to the left-hand side when I remove it. So I should have the reversibility of an inference rule means I can actually validate that the left-hand side of the expression of the step is consistent and the right-hand side of the step is consistent. Again, that's necessary but not sufficient. Uh, I also need to rely on the fact that the expressions themselves are, are self-consistent. So this is sort of the concept, but now we need to go off and think about how would we implement that in software. And a pretty standard way of making these expressions a little bit more uh, parsable by a machine is to introduce the concept of an abstract syntax tree, typically an AST. And that this just encapsulates the idea of I want to have an expression, like left-hand side equals right-hand side. I want, another, I want another expression on the bottom, like left-hand side plus x equals right-hand side plus x. And those are both represented by separate abstract syntax trees. So then you can think of the inference rule as the thing that transforms abstract syntax trees in a derivation. You might notice that even though we have really simple equations here, we're already introducing a lot of things going on. Um, and so this is not typically how humans think about expressions and derivations. It's a very computer-oriented view of, of math. And so therefore, we want to think about, well, if we actually want to make this accessible to humans, we'll have to think about how do we want to make it concise and readable. It's typically done using LaTeX. And we also want to be precise. We want to use something like a computer algebra system. There are lots of different ways of representing mathematical physics, often involving narrative text, which I'll refer to as prose. This is a written sort of description of what's going on. Uh, that's also very commonly used, um, but it's not very machine parsable. And then, uh, although LaTeX is an attractive sort of presentation mode, it isn't really that parsable in terms of machines. And so therefore, uh, math ML, uh, content ML, uh, are, are ways of showing the, the relations between the operators and the variables and the constants. Uh, associated with sort of which computer algebra system, there's lots of different choices there. Uh, so we have things like Mathematica, SymPy, um, and others. And what I care about as a sort of project owner here is I want software that other people would be able to use, independent sort of of their, their budget. Um, and, and I want to be able to inspect what's going on in, in the computer algebra system. So uh, for these reasons, um, I went with SymPy as a, my choice of what I'm going to use, and I also use LaTeX. So those are two um, big choices that I've made here. And there's a third one, which is which one of those is the primary representation, or how does the user sort of input things? So the choices are they could either provide the LaTeX, and then you, the computer tries to figure out, or maybe it's assisted by the human, how do I represent that precisely in something like SymPy? Or we could say, let's have the user provide the SymPy, and from that, we can generate the LaTeX. So either of those choices are, are sort of not good in the sense that they have problems. Um, and so because I'm biased towards making the project easy to use from my user standpoint about how to get things into the physics derivation graph, I've selected the input LaTeX first. And then if we, if we can or have the time to, we'll convert those I'll take expressions into SymPy. 
So another design decision that I was faced with is how do I track all these different things going on? And I realized that the expressions and the representations, like whether it's LaTeX or SymPy, it actually doesn't matter. All we want is that there's some way of identifying an expression. And so to sort of make the, the expression independent of representation, I've associated a numeric ID associated with that expression. And everything else in the same graph gets an expression ID. And those are unique to the node. That's just for ease of use when we're manipulating the graph, and sort of independent of how we represent the content in the node. All right, so given these sort of uh, ways of going uh, between the expression, the representation of the expression, and the graph, um, we can think back to a, a derivation is really a sequence of steps. And from that, you can realize there's a graph that's going on in the background. And if you really want to get fancy, you can think of, well, what if I have multiple different derivations and some of those derivations share the same expression? Uh, and so therefore you might want to have something more complicated like this. That becomes a little problematic when you want to describe the same, the, the same derivations in one document. And so therefore what we introduce um, is yet another variable to say, for a given expression, which derivation are you referring to it in? And so that local ID forms another index. So putting that all together, uh, you can recall that a derivation is a graph of steps, inference rules transfer expression, transform expressions in a step, and everything gets a unique ID. And so that, that gets uh, pretty big to manage. It's a big graph of directed edges relating different types of nodes. And, and so there's there's a lot going on already, and we're not even halfway there. So this is a lot of stuff going on just to track the things of a derivation. So there's a recap. What did we already talk about with respect to expressions? We just talked about the LaTeX, the computer algebra system, how to represent those things mathematically that a computer can then parse as an AST, and a couple of unique identifiers associated with how to manage those that information in a graph. So putting that all together, we, we add in sort of the AST as another thing associated with the expression nodes. Um, so that's one more thing to track. And then we run into another problem. Well, what if I want to use the letter F for frequency and another thing, another use of F, but not associated with frequency? So this uh, concept of symbol reuse or are the symbols unique? And you typically don't want to rely on just the strings. And so then we introduce yet another numeric index. So we're going back to this expression again. I'll transform wherever I see the letter V into some numeric ID and do the same thing with the other two variables. So that, that gets uh, into these long strings of numeric IDs and that can be referenced then in the abstract syntax tree. So now you can see sort of we're just doing manipulations of numeric IDs in a graph. That's the big story of the fixed iteration graph. And why you would do that is so that you can track sort of the, the uniqueness or consistency of variables and expressions and steps. And for rendering to a human user, then you'll always render back to sort of the thing that looks like LaTeX. But for the computer algebra system, it can manipulate these graphs by uh, node ID. All right, so, so far I've talked about sort of the graph data structure, um, how do you relate all the different things. We'll also need a way of storing all the text, and, and the nice thing is it is all plain text, um, so it's human readable in some sense, but how do we structure that on disk? So when I first started the project, I thought, of, well, we could use CSV tables. Those are pretty straightforward. It gets pretty complicated, and there's lots of different tables, and so then you might lead into, well, why don't we use a relational database like SQL? There's a lot of text and a lot of different relations among the texts, so that sort of makes sense. Uh, what I've been using for the past couple of years is a modified version of that is JSON, and it was easier to use, more compact, um, but it also introduced other problems. And so therefore, what I'm currently working on is a property graph-based representation. 
Um, so that's basically the concept of having a graph with nodes and edges. And then each of the nodes and the edges can have properties associated with each of them. So that's a property graph data structure. So if you choose that data structure, then you have a new problem. Well, you have uh, a new sort of representation, but you don't to introduce a new problem. And the problem is which technology are we going to use for a property graph since I don't want to invent my own. So there's lots of different choices, like RNDB and Neo4j, uh, and there's lots of query languages to go with each of them. And so therefore, based on the, the, the motive to have the graph easy to use, I'm going to go with Neo4j. So the last sort of thing that I'll leave you with is the uh, representation of how do I make all this visually accessible and, and readable to users who might not want to get around around the axle with Neo4j. Uh, I have a web interface that goes with all of this. The reason I chose a web interface is because I don't want to deploy a standalone application, nor do I want to make an iPhone app or Android app, and I want it to be free and easy to use. So that's the current sort of presentation is a the website. And again, the website is listed there as derivationmap.net. There's source code available. And this YouTube channel uh, gives some introductory material, and there's a blog. Thank you.